1933, prohibition was still in force. The manufacture, sale, and distribution of alcohol was still a federal offense. In April 1933, a new president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, led a new government into repeal. It was the first ray of sunshine to warm in America, chilled by economic depression. Overnight, drinkers came out of the closet, and they partied till dawn. Gangsters didn't join the celebrations. Prohibition had given them their greatest source of income, bootlegging. After the squeeze put on their activities by the Depression, many gangsters saw repeal as the last straw. Some gave up the rackets and drifted into the gutter. But the smart ones began to think of other ways to make a dirty dollar. They turned to an old favorite, gambling. We're a sports-loving people. Gambling had long held appeal for the mob. It was a victimless crime. It involved collusion and corruption, and gangsters could pose as Robin Hoods, providing the public with a service they wanted. During the 1930s, mob gambling interests really took off. The mobster's board of directors, the self-styled National Crime Commission, soon had tentacles stretching from coast to coast. The main enforcer of mob gambling interests was syndicate boss Lucky Luciano's trusted lieutenant, Ben Bugsy Siegel. He went where the gamblers had money, and that meant spending more and more time in LA and in Hollywood. Siegel's job, to tie the mob into existing gambling setups. With every bet, gangsters got a percentage. It's a system that still exists today. But in 1935, on the streets of New York, a turf war broke out that overshadowed Siegel's West Coast gambling success. The new-style, low-profile mob was drawn into a battle for control of a street lottery called the Numbers Racket. The staging area was Harlem. And the main combatant was one of the oddest characters in gangland, Arthur Flegenheimer, AKA Dutch Schultz. Schultz had made a fortune out of bootlegging in the Bronx, but he was a loner, a maverick, a loose cannon. He kept his dealings with Luciano and the syndicate to a minimum. Now he wanted the numbers in Harlem. The Harlem numbers racket was controlled by this woman, Stephanie Sinclair. She offered long odds in the last three digits of the stock market index published daily in the newspapers. People would bet a nickel on getting the numbers right. Winning meant a big payoff. Schultz didn't just want a cut of the action. He wanted all of the action. But negotiations in Harlem proved bloody and costly. Schultz was in breach of the New Style mobster's code. He was drawing too much attention to himself. And sure enough, he became a target of the law. The feds hit Schultz with an income tax wrap which generated national coverage. Schultz beat the rap, but grew obsessed with taking revenge on the man behind the prosecution, New York DA Thomas Dewey. Dewey had political ambitions. He wanted to be state governor of New York. He decided to enhance his reputation by going after the mob. The Dutchman's hatred of Dewey led to a stormy meeting of the mob's board of directors. When he stormed out of the room, they, uh, we got to take steps to protect Tom Dewey because this loose cannon, this maniac, is going to ruin it for everybody. He's got to be hit. No question about it. He has to be hit. This was the man chosen for the job, Charlie Workman, known to associates as the bug. The guy was a psychopathic killer, stone cold. And he'd kill anybody, believe me. The venue for the hit was once again to be that favorite spot for mob murder, a restaurant. Charlie the Bug had chosen well. It was almost too easy. He wiped out the Dutch Schultz mob, just walked, barged right in, went in the back and started blazing away. When police arrived on the scene, this is how they found Schultz, barely alive. He hung on for three days before death claimed him. The incorrigible Dutchman was no more. <laughs> 